Hello, and welcome back to another Python tutorial. So I'm actually going to be redoing one of my video series. Uh, in particular, I'm going to be redoing the linear regression model tutorial. Um, so I, re I did it, and I had some people kind of reach out, or uh, basically there were some situations when I was looking back at it that I realized I had kind of glossed over some stuff and I kind of was debating, you know, should I just maybe add more detail to the actual document itself or should I kind of just, you know, take the opportunity and redo the videos. And I've decided that it's probably best to redo the video. Um, some of this will look almost identical to what I did in the last series, but other parts of it, we're going to go into a little bit more detail and really kind of understand what is the process that we are doing here. Because when I explained the last video, I, I really emphasize, I want you guys to understand the process of building this type of model and really what are we trying to do with it. And you know, understanding kind of the flaws that kind of come along with it, where we can run into trouble, and being able to interpret the output. Now, with that being said, uh, where does this fit in the bigger scheme of things? Well, right now what we're doing is we're going to start covering more machine learning models. And machine learning is a very hot topic field right now inside of, you know, data science and things like that because of the value um, it's promising. And really, how do we think about machine learning? Well, what we're trying to do is we're trying to create algorithms or, or basically create programs that are able to solve problems without being explicitly told how to solve them. And so what we're doing is we're giving them a framework and says, hey, you know, this type of framework seems to work with these types of problems. Uh, what we want to do is we want to feed you some data. And then what we're going to do is train you on how to look for the right answer in a sense. And so really the idea behind it is we're going to feed a model a bunch of data. And when we feed that data to the model, it's being trained. And so it's getting better at detecting the correct output. Now, no model is perfect. No model will be 100% accurate, but we can make models that actually perform really well. Now, with inside of machine learning, there are many types of models that we can use. There's classification models, there's regression models, there's decision trees, um, and so on and so on. So there's different types of models for different types of problems. Well, in today's video, we're going to cover the linear regression model. What is a linear regression model and really why should we even use this type of model or where should we use it? Well, with a linear regression model, what we need to think about is that we have th these variables and our belief is that there is some kind of relationship between these variables. So the linear regression model attempts to model the relationships between these two variables by fitting a linear equation, basically a line to the observed data. So basically we try to plop a line in between all of our data set and we try to pick a location where some of the some of the uh, values are a little bit above and some are below, but basically on average our error kind of uh, averages out to zero. And so that's what we're trying to do with a linear regression model. We're trying to we're, we're basically saying there's a relationship between these two variables and we're trying to model that relationship. And what we can do with this model is then we can measure um, what that actual relationship is. We can measure the association with it, so the strength of that association. And we can use an equation to describe the relationship and use that equation to predict unknown values. Now, in our particular example, what we are going to try to model is we're basically claiming or we're trying to answer this particular question, which is, does the price of a barrel of oil impact the price of a single share of Exxon mobile stock? So can we take the price of a barrel of oil? It does it do a good job at predicting the price of a single share of Exxon mobile stock? So that is what we're trying to answer with this particular model. Now, with that being said, what I'm going to do is I'm going to jump into my Excel workbook and I'm going to show you what the data looks like. So I currently have an Excel workbook and there's three columns of data. The first column contains an individual date and on that individual date, it has the price of a single share of ExxonMobil, so basically ExxonMobil stock, 
and a single price for a barrel of oil. And so this data goes from March 28th, 2014 to March 25th, 2019. So there's about five years worth of data in here. This data set is not perfect in every way. So I purposely made this data set a little bit messy because I think it kind of sets the stage for a more realistic analysis. A lot of times when we get a data set, very rarely is it good to go and clean. A lot of times we have to remove values. We have to make sure the data types are all aligned and things along that nature. And so <clears throat> I think it's this column at least. Uh, if you look at this particular column, there actually are missing values. So we're gonna explain how to handle these missing values so that way it doesn't impact the performance of our model. We also wanna make sure that our column names are correctly spelled. This one is purposely misspelled. Um, and then also we wanna be able to handle the correct data type. So right now when we import this into pandas, uh, there's no guarantee that this will be imported as a date. Um, and then same with these guys over here, there's no guarantee that when we import this into pandas that it will be imported um, as a float. So we need to take the steps necessary to verify that what we're putting into pandas makes sense. So hopefully that gives you a little context of what we're trying to do and gives you a little bit of a context of what the problem is that we're trying to solve. Again, just to reiterate, all we're trying to determine is does the price of a single barrel of oil, does it do a good job at predicting uh, the price of a share of Exxon Mobil stock. Okay, so with that being said, let's jump back into our Jupyter Notebook um, at the top, and you guys will all get access to this particular PDF file or Jupyter Notebook. Um, I just kind of lay some background, so just an introduction uh, about kind of more of the history. I at least I'm kind of a history nerd, so I like to kind of say, you know, what have we done historically when it comes to predicting outcomes and stuff like that, and how has that changed over the years and stuff like that. And then I also uh, kind of go into the background of the problem and describe what a linear regression model is and the formula that we're basically creating because this is really what we're doing is we're creating this formula, which ideally this should look familiar to a lot of people. It's just a, it's a line formula. So we have some kind of uh, uh, intercept and then we have a, an X value that has a coefficient that belongs to it. And so all we're trying to do is uh, estimate these different values right here so b0 and b1 and apparently uh, i didn't like that it just decided to go like that <laughs> okay so the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to import our libraries uh, keep in mind we're going to be using a lot of different libraries in this particular exercise uh, pandas obviously matplotlib we want to be able to plot our data so that way visually we can explore it so we're going to need that um, i believe i used numpy at some point down in the, the model the stats model API. So when we actually build our model, we're going to want to evaluate it. You know, sklearn does a good job. There are some metrics. So right here, sklearn, uh, they do have some metrics that do, you know, for the most part, a decent job. But the stats model API library, it's got a lot of good stuff available to us. And so there's just a little bit more of a robust, I guess, summary at the end of the day. On um, certain metrics, we're going to need the math library in order to compute them. And then one of the big things right here is um, <clears throat> the sklearn library. So this is where we're going to actually, uh, you know, create an instance of the linear regression model, split and train our data, and then also calculate some metrics. So each one of these is just a different aspect of that library. And then we have scipy. So this is also used for computing certain types of metrics when it comes to exploring our data. So it's really important that we understand what the data looks like. Um, is it skewed? Is it not skewed? Does it have any outliers? Um, and if so, what do we need to do based on that? Okay, so the first thing we'll do is we'll load our data. So all this is right here is it's a variable and this is pointing to my Excel file that is right here. I'm gonna close out this Excel file because it will fail if I have it open. And then I did choose to use the raw string method when creating this path. So what the raw string method allows me to do is I don't have to do double slashes. I can just do a single slash and I'm good to go. So what we'll do is we'll load our data into a data frame. So I'm going to create a new variable. I'll call it price data. So this will be the data frame object. I will call my pandas library and then I'll call the read <coughs> 
Excel method. And then I'm just going to simply pass through my path variable. And so this will create a new data frame for me. What I'm going to want to do is I first thing I almost always do when it comes to uh, looking at my data is I always just grab the first five rows. Oh, well, I should import my library first. I did that on the last video too. I just always skip over that one for some reason. Um, so I call the head method. The head method just returns the first five rows of data. That to me, it's just my sanity check. Did it actually import it and were there any errors? Um, otherwise, uh, a lot of times I can just set yourself up for failure where you didn't actually load in and then all of a sudden you're getting all sorts of errors. So um, that's just here for my reference. Now, what I do notice here is I do have three columns of data, but I would really like this date column right here to be my index. So I wouldn't, I don't want my index to be these little indexes right here. I, I really want it to be my date column. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to set my date column to be my index. But what I want to make sure is that when I set my date column as an index, that it is a true date time object. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to call my price data data frame. I'm going to call the index method. And then I'm going to pass through what I want to be the index. Well, I can just pass through the date column, but I also wanted to make sure that it's going to be a date time. So in order to ensure that, I'm going to call panda to underscore date time. And then I'm going to call my data frame again. And then I'm going to select the column that I want to convert to a date time. And so that's what this will do is this, this will create, this will, well, this will set my index <clears throat> to the date column and also make sure that the date column is a true date time object. Now, when I do this, let's see what we get. So we can see that we now have our date column, but we still got the old one. So we need to drop that old column. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to drop my old date column and I'm going to have a new data frame that's going to equal uh, the old data frame minus that particular um, what is it, date column. Now there's multiple ways to do this. Technically you could just select the columns too, but for variety purposes, let's just use the drop method. So we'll create a new variable. We'll call it price data again. We'll call our old price data frame. I'll call the drop method. And then I'm going to pass through the column that I want to drop. In this case, I want to drop my old date column. And then I have to specify along which axis. Well, in this case, I want it to be my column axis. So that's just going to be equal to one. And then after that, again, we're just going to print out the first five rows. That's all we're doing. Okay. Okay. And so from here, now we have a data frame that looks pretty good. I mean, at least it's in working order. We, we still know there's missing values. We know there's, you know, uh, naming things that we have to fix. But at least at this point, we have a data frame object. And now we can kind of move forward. Okay, so the first thing after that is after we have our data frame, one of the first things I always do is check the data types. <laughs> Never assume that it was loaded correctly because a lot of times that will bite you down the road. So in order to check the data types, I call my data frame object and then I call the D types property. And then this prints out just a little summary that shows me basically what everything is. And so the first one is a float 64, the oil price column, uh, that's a float 64 as well. So overall, I'm actually really happy with this. I think this will work fine for what we need to do. Everything's the proper data type. And then the D type, uh, basically for our index, we, we verified that because we know it's a date time object. So at this point, I'm actually happy. There's no changes I have to make, but it's still a very crucial step that you check the data types once you load in your data frame, just to make sure things actually worked right. But we did notice up here that actually we have some columns that are named incorrectly. And so we want to fix that. So we want to make sure that the, the columns actually are spelt correctly. And so what I'm going to do is we're going to create a dictionary object that will have two values. The first value will be the key. The key is the old column name. And then the value that is associated with that key will be the new column name. And so I like to just call it new columns or sometimes what I'll do too is I'll call it new column names. And then again, it's just a dictionary where the key is the old column name, and then the value is the new column name. <clears throat> 
And then once I have that dictionary, we're going to rename our old data frame. So what I'll do is I'll create a new variable called price data, and then it will equal our old data frame after we call the rename method. And then I'm going to specify what I want to rename. I want to rename my columns. And so I'll pass through my new column names. Ooh, not like that. So again, taking my old data frame, calling the rename method, and then specifying what I want to rename. I'm specifying the columns. And then what this will do is I'm passing through my dictionary. So if I don't have my particular column in here, it just skips over it. So it's only looking for the ones that I'm specifying. And then again, just to make sure that everything came out correctly, I like to print the first five rows. Oh, well, would help if I spelt it correctly. Okay, and so now we can clearly see that the data frame has been renamed. Everything looks good at this point. So I think at this point, uh, we're pretty good to go. We have everything named correctly. Um, we checked the data types and we also loaded the data. So one final thing that we're gonna do is we're gonna handle the missing values because I explicitly told you when we were looking at the Excel workbook that we actually had some missing values that were inside of our data frame. Now, when it comes to missing values, there's a lot of debate of how you could handle them. It really depends the problem at hand. A lot of times what I tend to do is if I, if I have missing values, I try to populate it with something usually. Um, if not, then I'll just drop those rows. And so there's two methods. You can always do fill NA or you can do drop NA. Now in this particular example, we're just gonna drop those values because we only have uh, one variable. So unfortunately, if we don't have an oil price, it really doesn't make a lot of sense to keep that row. And so it makes more sense to actually just get rid of that row. Now to check for missing values, what we can do is we can always just do call the price. What we'll do is we'll call the actual price data frame. We'll say is NA. So we'll call the is NA method and then we'll call any. <clears throat> and so what this will do is it gives us a little bit of a summary. And so what it will say is if it comes back false, there were no missing values. But if it comes back true, there were some missing values. So it looks like with our oil price column, there are definitely some missing values. So we want to drop those missing values. So what we'll do is we'll create a new variable called price data that will equal our old data frame after we call the drop NA method. And the drop NA method will simply do this. If it finds a row that has a missing value, it will drop that row. Now, what you can do, depending on the problem at hand, is you can actually set a certain threshold if you want. So what you can basically say is, well, if there's three missing values, then drop the row. But if there's only one, two, or two missing values, you can keep that row. Now, in this particular example, if there's a missing value, I just want to drop that row. And so after I do that, I like to just, again, verify that there are no missing values. And so this is me verifying that they actually did get removed. And so now I see false for both of those columns. So now I can say with confidence there are no missing values in this particular data frame. And with that being said, that is the end of our first video. If you have any questions about what we covered in this particular video, when it comes to dropping values, when it comes to naming columns, data types, or even loading it into Excel, you know, please put them down in the comments below and I'll try to get back to you. Um, and then in our next video, we're going to explore the data sets. So we're going to see how to explore the data set and check for things like outliers and skewness and things along that nature. So thanks again for watching, guys. We will see you in the next video.